Well, we now uh, come to our time around the Word of God, and I'll get you to take your Bible and turn to James, uh, James chapter 1. Uh, we're going to wait another couple weeks till we get back into the book of uh, Hebrews uh, for a couple reasons. One, uh, we're going to continue our series on anger this morning, as you can see from your, your bulletin, and a number of you have uh, either texted me, emailed, or even said to me that uh, the the, the series has been quite helpful, very practical. All of us, to one degree or another, have particular anger issues. And I think the practical help with it all has been that um, you can substitute whatever your issue is um, by way of uh, dealing with your anger. So whether you have anxiety, whether you have lust issues, fear issues, uh, the, the Bible says the same thing about all of that. Or at least approaches the the issue the same way, and it's always by uh, the, the Word of God in the hands of the Spirit of God, when you discipline yourself for godliness, um, you can overcome those things by the power of the Holy Spirit, as I, we just mentioned from Ephesians uh, 2. The, the other reason why I'm, I'm waiting a couple weeks is if you happen to look into Hebrews chapter 10, we finished Hebrews 9, we're heading into Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10 is basically a recap uh, a summary of uh, Hebrews 7, 8, and 9. And I just thought, well, if I come right back into Hebrews 10 after finishing chapter 9, I'm just, I'm just preaching chapter 9 again. Uh, and I, uh, I, I, I might um, find you looking out the window and tuning me out for a bit. So um, uh, I thought, well, let's wait a couple of weeks so you forget everything in chapter 9. We'll come back and revisit it when we get to chapter 10. Uh, so this morning... We'll continue in uh, our series on the complexities of anger, uh, and we'll even continue tonight, and then one more, Lord willing, next Sunday morning, and that'll be it. And then the following Sunday, we'll come back to the book of Hebrews. But let's begin this morning by reading James chapter 1, and I just want to read the first 18 verses. James chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, um, and you'll, you'll see a little bit later why I'm beginning uh, with this text. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives you all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting. For the doubter is like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of humble circumstances boast in his exaltation. But let the rich boast in his humiliation, because he will pass away like a flower of the field. For the sun rises, and together with the scorching wind dries up the grass, its flower falls off, and its beautiful appearance perishes. In the same way, the rich person will wither away while pursuing his activities. Blessed is the one who endured trials, endures trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. No one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God, since God is not tempted by evil, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. But each person is tempted, tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. By his own choice, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And we'll stop there. Now, uh, as you can see in your bulletin, this is. Um, the series of the complexities of anger, and this is part seven, part seven of that series, and we are up to point number seven. In your bulletin, there's an outline just to uh, show you the, the flow of how we're tackling this subject. Um, we're up to the 
to point seven. So we've already done points one through six. We've talked about the diagnosis of anger or, or the definition of anger, and that was uh, very important that we understand uh, what the Bible uh, or how the Bible defines anger. The world has its own definitions, but we're more interested in God's. Then we looked at the discernment of anger, and that was just basically uh, how, how do we discern whether anger is righteous or unrighteous? Those are the only two um, options. Uh, anger is not something neutral. It's not something amoral. Uh, anger is either righteous or unrighteous, but for most of us, we, we probably think we're angry righteously most of the time, when in fact, if we look at the criteria that the Bible gives on what righteous anger is, we, we fall short. But most of our anger is unrighteous anger. So we covered that quite a bit. Um, and the reason sometimes we think we're justified in our anger is because there's a deception to anger, because there's a deception to all kinds of sin. Uh, and that was point number three. We, we talked about that, the deception of anger. And then when we are deceived, there comes danger. And that was point number four. When we, we get deceived and when we become angry, um, and depending upon the object of our anger, uh, as I said before, it ends up being like a grenade um, at, at minimum. <laughs> it could, could be worse. Um, uh, it could be a literal grenade, but it becomes kind of a metaphorical grenade because as the pin is pulled and you explode, uh, you explode not just at that person, but perhaps there's shrapnel that flies around to everybody else that gets hit at the same time. Um, so it's a serious issue. It's a serious issue because the Bible addresses the issue, um, which means then, well, what are the causes? And that's point number five. What, what are the determinants, just to keep the D alliteration here? What, what are the determinants of anger? And we talked a lot about that. And ultimately, it comes down to the, the matter of the heart. That, that where, that's where everything comes out of, whether it's lust or anxiety or fear, but certainly anger, it comes out of the heart. So knowing yourself uh, and, and knowing what your nature is, going back to our catechism, obviously gets us on the road in understanding the causes. And then once we get the, the causes, or once we understand the de determinants, then we can deal with the what? With the, with the cures or the dealings as we put it there in point number six. And we spent quite a bit of time on, on the dealings. What, what are the, the means of grace generally uh, and specifically? And, and by the way, just as a footnote, that's what we're actually going to continue tonight. I didn't want to bring it back into this morning since we already started that uh, point. But if you want to come back tonight, we're going to continue talking more about some specific ways to deal with your, your anger. Uh, but we've said enough by way of uh, general observations to keep moving here in the mornings. And so what's left? What's left is this point number seven, uh, and that's just what I call discussing anger. Discussing anger. In, in a sense, we're done. Um, but what, what could be lingering in, in terms of maybe you have questions, uh, and I, I might have some questions for you, and, and that's coming under this point, discussing anger. Um, you say, well, what, what kind of questions might come? And there could be a host of them. I, I kind of narrowed it down to three, three different types of, of questions. One could be, um, how can you be angry and yet not sin? I mean, that's what Ephesians 4, 26 says. Paul says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. What, what does that mean? Um, is that a command? Is that just a statement? Um, it's, it's really hard to understand specifically what Paul uh, is saying by way of it being a command or statement. Uh, but even apart from a statement or command, what does that mean? Be angry and yet do not sin. Uh, I don't know if, if you know that he's actually quoting a psalm here. He's quoting Psalm 4. So in many respects, we would have to go back to probably Psalm 4, understand Psalm 4, and then bring it back here to Ephesians to get that. But I, I'm going to bypass that. That's a good question. And maybe we can come back to that if I get enough um, suggestions in the suggestion box. Todd, please come back to that. I, I will. Uh, but I'm going to bypass that. Another question I'm going to bypass is this. Um, is it okay to be angry with yourself? Now, I, I'm chuckling just asking the question because I, I just find it silly. But, but you hear that all the time. Um, you, you may not hear it in the church, but you, you would hear it outside. You know, my problem is I've never forgiven myself. You ever heard that before? What does that mean? I have no idea what that means. Forgive myself? 
I mean, that's my problem. I just have to forgive myself. I mean, obviously the first question we ask, is that biblical? No. Um, forgive myself? There's nowhere in the Bible that talks about that I need to forgive myself and thus, you know, it's okay to be angry with yourself. But again, I, I, th that I think we can just immediately bypass, which then leads us to a, a third question. And it's the question I want to park us in and, and begin discussing this morning. And everything I want to say about it won't be finished. So we'll have to come back and finish it next Sunday, but we'll, we'll get a, a start. And it's this question. And it's, 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 it's the question um, I think will be probably the most practical of, of all the things we've talked about. And, and the question is, is it ever permissible to be angry with God? You got that? That, that? That's what I want us to just really get a handle on and certainly answer and be convinced of, of the answer. But is it okay to be angry with God? Is it ever justifiable? Is it ever right to be angry with God? God. I mean, what's your immediate answer to that? Well, as you're thinking about that, let me just begin by giving you a, just a number of verses, just to, to get the ball rolling here. I, I want you to listen. Don't turn to these texts. Just listen. Daniel 4.35. This is right from the lips of Nebuchadnezzar. This is after his four years, or seven years rather, uh, of humiliation. Remember, because of his pride, God humbled him. And, uh, and after those seven years, he kind of came back to his to his um, whereabouts, and, and he says this. Th this is the decree that goes out to his empire. And, and, and just a footnote, I think, I think Daniel had a hand in this. The, the way that it's worded, um, you, it just looks like Daniel had a, a, a word in this. And by the way, I think we will see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven one day. I, the language points that this was an ongoing thing. Um, if grammar means anything, the, 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 the Hebrew here has the idea, this is what I do now, and this is what I do on and on and on. But just listen to what he says in Daniel 4.35. He says, for the Lord's dominion, Yahweh's dominion, in fact, is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. Listen to this. He does according to his will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth, no one, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? And that's what I'm zeroing in on. No one, no one can restrain his hand, no one can oppose him, nor can anyone say, what have you done? And why have you done it? In other words, no one can question God. God is God. That's his point. You can't question God. Now, Paul says something similar in Romans chapter 9. Remember with the whole objections to the doctrine of election. He says this, who are you, a mere human being, to criticize God? Should the thing that was created say to the one who made it, why have you made me like this? That's, that's God's reply. You got some objections about what God does. Who are you? Who are you? Again, you can't question God. Jeremiah, and we may talk more about Jeremiah and Lamentations next week because it's one of my favorite texts in this whole discussion. But, but for now, Lamentations 3, and this goes a bit further. Notice what Jeremiah says in Lamentations. And the reason it's Lamentations is because Jerusalem just what, what, what was destroyed, right? Jerusalem is destroyed. Woe is the city. He's lamenting, hence lamentations, about the, the destruction of the city, but also the destruction of the people, and he himself getting caught up in all of that. And he says this, Can anything happen without the Lord's permission? Is it not the Most High who helps one and harms another? Then why should we, mere humans, complain when we are punished for our sins? That's Lamentations 3.39 if you want to look that up. In other words, you can't complain. You're a sinner. As long as you are out of hell, you have nothing to complain about. Right? And maybe one more, just to give you the idea of where we're heading with all this. Proverbs 19.13. This is probably the clearest. Proverbs 19.3, rather, says this, people ruin their lives by their own foolishness, and then they are angry at God. Catch that? 
Let me say that again. People ruin your lives with their own foolishness, <laughs> but it's not their fault. No, they turn around and they get angry at God. Or, or to say it another way, only fools get angry at God. Sinners complain against God. So it, it goes back to our question, is it ever okay, especially as Christians, is it ever okay for us to be angry at God? Is it permissible to hold in our heart or voice with our own mouth anger against God? And of course, the answer, of course, is what? No, absolutely not. Just to be clear, right from the offset, offset. No, it is never right. It is never okay for us to be angry with God. The Bible strictly forbids this. The Bible strictly forbids any kind of venting your feelings against God. The, the Bible actually has a word for that, and it's called blasphemy. Those are blasphemous thoughts, and I know we have all had them. That's why this is a very practical subject. You remember in Pilgrim's Progress, he's walking by uh, the delectable mountains, and, and, and he, he hears voices. He voices from the hole that's coming down, all these shrieks and everything, and then all of a sudden, it, it says he hears it from his own head. It's the heart of man. Never, never is it okay to be angry with God. It is a blasphemy. And there's two reasons that we need to, to really pull all of this out, unpack it, to, 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 for, for why we need to discuss this. Two reasons. One, uh, regrettably, the Church of Jesus Christ at large shows much confusion on this matter, and I'll, I'll give you some examples of that pretty soon. I mean, I ask you guys the question, is it ever okay to be angry with God? And I hope all of you would say, no, it's never. But there's Christians out there that actually say, no, it's okay to be angry with God. And you can be angry with God. So we need to talk about that. Secondly, and the second reason why I want to unpack this a bit further is that while all of us here, as I said, I hope agree that getting angry with God is wrong in principle, sadly, many, many of us in practice do fall in the trap of getting angry with God. Wittingly, unwittingly, intentionally or unintentionally, at times, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our grief, in the midst of our suffering, we, like Adam, you are the one that gave me her, that put me into this trouble. So yeah, did he blame Eve? Yes, but he ultimately blamed God, the woman you gave me. And a lot of times in our own pain and suffering and grief, we do the exact same thing. And that's why James says, you can't blame God. There's, there's no point in your life, at any point, even in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your suffering and your grief, you can blame, blame God. But I know we do. So we need to talk about that. How do we avoid not blaming God or getting angry with God? So just, just so you know where we're heading with all this, that's the two things I want us to discuss. The current, current church's thinking on this issue and then critique that thinking with some biblical precautions why we can never be angry with God. So we're back to our question. Is it ever, angry, uh, is it ever okay to be angry with God? Well, again, I think just from the few Bible verses that I read from you, it, it seems clear and we can give you a whole bunch more. But as I said, it, it, it's, it's not universal, I guess you can say, that it is never okay to be angry with God. Now, we get that Christians, not, sorry, non-Christians get angry with God. That's part of their nature. I mean, you'll remember Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage? Why do they plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth prepare for battles. The rulers plot together against the Lord and against his anointed. That, that's anger. That, that's military language. They're, they're lining up militarily against God as if you know, they're going to battle with God. There, there's God, there's his anointed, and they are, you know, the, the language actually is uh, warrior peoples, nations, And the reason why they do that is because they want to, what, break their chains. They, 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 they want freedom. They feel that like God's some kind of a cosmic killjoy that's just impending on all their freedoms. And, and they just want to be loosed from all of that so they can just do whatever they want to do. So they're angry with God because God, God won't let them be who they want to be. 
God's this great restrainer, so to speak. Freedom, autonomy, no accountability, no judgment. That, that's the heart of man. So like I said, we expect the guy on the street to be angry with God. Raging against God, in fact. Even uh, kind of an open scoffing. And some of you have been uh, the, the, the bearers of that when you talk to some of these people. Now, most of that normally doesn't come out on an everyday basis. Most of the time it comes out when there's some trouble that they have, right? But most people don't even think about God on a daily basis. They just whiffly do whatever they want until some kind of trouble comes and then it's human nature to take over where they blame God and they get angry with God. They press the broil against God button and it all comes out. Everything that's in their heart against God comes to the fore and just explodes out of their mouth. Remember Job's wife? You, you could say Job's wife speaks for them all. What did, what, did, what did she tell Job after you know, they lost their children, they lost um, their servants, their livestock? I mean, you, you think of all the things they lost. Uh, Job's wife comes along to Job and says two words, what? Curse God. Curse God. Curse God and die, Job. Curse him. Shout blasphemies at God. Just, just take your Bible and turn to Revelation 16. So you, you can see it not just in one person, but you can see it in a group. And in Revelation 16, three, three times in just one chapter, it says that men blaspheme and curse God when judgments are coming upon the earth, these bold judgments that are unleashed in Revelation 16. N notice what it says there in verse 9 of Revelation 16, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God. They cursed God. They were angry with God. Verse 11, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. Go down to verse 21. And great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone weighing 75 pounds. And then what? Men blasphemed God because of the hail since that plague was exceedingly great. The more heat that came, the more judgment that came, the greater what? Blasphemy all coming from the heart of men. And as I said, we expect this. We expect this from unbelievers. We expect this from those whose heart is hardened by unbelief, uh, who love sin, and ultimately, with their love of sin, they hate God, they're angry with God, and, and it's, it comes to a point where they're openly, what, cussing him out, blaspheming. Now, as I said, we, 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 we get that. We, we get that with unbelievers. But what about Christians? What about you? Is, is that acceptable? Do we expect Christians to vent angry feelings towards God? Now, tragically, in many churches and in many so-called Christian counseling books, uh, their, their thinking is um, that it's okay. That, that it's okay for, for, for Christians to be angry with God. And not just okay, but it's right and helpful. L let me just... Let me give you a few quotes here. And I just find this unbelievable. But just listen to a typical Christian psychologist. Quote, if you are angry at God, you need to do four things. First, this is what they say. First, remember anger is uh, uh, just is. Anger is just is. It's neither good or bad. It's okay to feel angry at God. He made us with some angry emotions. Secondly, God often lets us down and disappoints us. How else can we explain being abused and crying out to him for deliverance, yet the abuse continue? If he is supposed to be in control, why didn't he stop it? And he didn't. Third, you need to ventilate your anger at God. He will absorb your honest anger, so don't be afraid to tell him exactly what you feel and what you think. Many Psalms portray anger at God, so if other godly people have let out their rage at him, so can you. Say it like you feel it, so you won't be a hypocrite. Fourth, and it's the same author here, and this is amazing. Fourth, you need to forgive God. You need to let go of the hostility to be at peace with yourself and to build a trusting relationship with God. Forgive him for the ways he let you down, end quote. 
Now talk about blasphemy. Uh, that, that's from a Christian, quote, unquote, Christian psychologist. I don't know where you start with this. Uh, I mean, the Psalms don't portray anger at God, so they got that wrong. And it's serious, uh, a misreading, uh, as we'll see as we look at some of the Psalms. Uh, the Psalmists never get angry with God. Um, forgiving God, that, that's just blasphemy. We have no right to forgive God as sinners. Uh, God doesn't need our forgiveness. Uh, he never does wrong. He never sins. He never does evil. So th again, there's nothing to forgive him ab about. And then with this idea that God often lets us down, disappoints us, that's equally blasphemous. It reminded me, some of you are a bit cluey, and it's still lingering around, but about 20-something years ago, there was this heresy that creeped into the church called open theism. Uh, this idea that God is uh, open to his knowledge of the future. He knows perfect past. He knows perfect present. Um, but purposefully, he puts his, ties his hand behind his back, as it were, to know the future. Uh, and that's because if he does know the future and doesn't deal with the future like evil, then I don't want to serve a God like that, they would say. It, it, in other words, it, they're trying to get God off the hook. If God really knows the future but doesn't do anything about it, that's not a God I want to serve. And you've heard that before, right? But if God doesn't know the future, then I, I can deal with a God like that a bit more. So I, I can't blame him if something bad happens because he didn't know about it. You see that? That's, that's heresy. That's not what the Bible said. The, the Bible is very clear that God knows the perfect past, it, he knows the perfect present, and he, and he knows the perfect uh, future. In fact, he's already planned the future. And, and, it, and it's just unraveling as he's planned, even at this moment. I think I said it a couple of weeks ago, the very fact that the Bible begins with in the beginning assumes there's an end. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Th that three-letter, three-word phrase in the beginning assumes that there's going to be an end. In fact, Isaiah says, from the beginning to the end, I am God and there is no other. So much, if not all of what I just read to you, is blasphemous. Again, there, there's no scriptural reason Logical reason to be angry with God. But, but I don't know if you picked up, though, they, they, the very premise is wrong. Remember they said, anger just is. It's neither good or bad. And that goes all the way back to our definition, our diagnosis for anger. We said it, that, that's not true. It, it's not amoral. It's not neutral. It, it's either just or unjust. It's either righteous or unrighteous. It, it's not just is. It's, it's just it's there. In fact, you can see on your bulletin, we have that definition of our anger. Anger is a response to a negative moral judgment against perceived evil. Now, you take that definition of what that Christian psychologist said and you put it into that definition, this is what you come out with. If you are angry at God, then by definition, listen, by definition, what have you just done? If you are angry with God, then you assume that God has wronged you, right? And by definition, you have judged God to have done a perceived moral evil towards you. Now, th you know, think about that the next time you want to get angry with God. You get angry with God. You voice your anger with God. You, you are basically saying, God, you, you, you've done a, 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 an evil thing towards me. Can you say that? You're actually accusing God of wrongdoing. I will never trust a God who let me down like that. I will never trust a God that let that happen to me. You ever heard that before? Maybe you've said that, but I've certainly heard other people say that to me. I can't, I can't, I can't worship a God that does that. And maybe we haven't said it in those specific words, but maybe we have said it in ways like, you know, where's God in all this? Why would the Lord let me face such a nightmare? I mean, after all I've done for you, Lord, is this the thanks I get? Is, is this what a good God does to his people? I mean, you, you've heard those kind of questions, maybe even ask them yourself. 
it all goes back to none of us like pain, none of us like suffering, none of us like trials, but once we understand the purpose of pain, suffering, and trials, we would never say that. In fact, we would embrace our pain, suffering, and trials. I mean, I just read for you James 1. What do the pain and the trials and the suffering do? It produces what? Maturity. It produces Christ's likeness. That's why you consider it all. Most people don't know the purpose of trials. Most Christians don't understand the purpose of trials. And if you understood the purpose of trials, you wouldn't ask these questions. Again, you would never accuse God of wrongdoing. Now, why do we ask those questions? And, and sometimes the questions are okay. It's just the, the attitude behind the questions. I mean, we'll look at the Psalms. The Psalms ask why, why, why all the time. How long, how long? There's, there's a distance there, but there's also a, a, a submissive, humble attitude in understanding that God is God and, and I am not, but I'm not angry with God. The psalmists never betray anger. They might complain to God, but they never complain about God. And there's a big difference there. Did you catch that? You're in a covenantal relationship with him. And as a covenantal relationship, whether he's the king and you are the, uh, the slave, uh, you, you have that relationship where you can. Like you come to your parents. But you never complain to them about God. You can complain to God. But, but, but begs the question, why do we sometimes complain about God and ask some of these blasphemous questions? Well, just to diagnose it, it's because God did not give you what you thought you should have done. Do you catch that? You thought you deserved X, Y, and Z. He didn't give you X, Y, and Z, so you are angry with him for not giving you X, Y, and Z. It's, it's pretty simple. And if you stop and think and meditate, and you go, yeah, Todd's right. That's exactly how it went down. Sometimes we think that God's some, some, some magical genie that if I just, you know, rub the lamp, he comes out and he gets me my wishes. And if he doesn't get my wishes, go, I'll go back in the lamp. Right? The way he doesn't give you what you thought he should have done or have given you or the way he should have given it to you or when he should have given it to you, uh, any of those little scenarios, you get angry. The what, the why, the when. In all of it, you, you believe God has failed you. And as a result, we judge him. That, that's at the root of our anger towards God. Listen, what we want, listen carefully. What we want and what we believe about God is where the whole thing comes undone. You got that? You, you, you wrestle with that and you're clear on that. That, that'll be the end of it. First, your wants and desires were not met. They were not fulfilled. And then secondly, you believe that God should have given you those wants and desires. And because he didn't give you those wants and desires that you thought you deserved, you get angry with him. Think about Cain. We talked about Cain before, but he's a good example of this. Cain, Genesis 4, he gets angry with God. And why? Because God didn't give him what he wanted. David, David gave, gets angry with God in 1 Chronicles 13 because Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the Ark of the Covenant. Remember that? I mean, God, all the things I've done for you, we're bringing back the Ark and you do this? And Jonah, of course, is a good example. He gets angry with God. Why does he get angry with God? Oh, you saved those those wretched Ninevites, those Assyrians, why did you do that? I wanted them dead. I mean, if you want to understand uh, Jonah's attitude of, and why he didn't go to Assyria, maybe today's modern example would be, you know, some, you know, asking uh, some Israelite to go to uh, Gaza and, and witness to the, the Hamas. I mean, that, that's, that's the attitude towards each other. That's why he ran off. And then when he did preach and they did get converted, he gets angry over it. I mean, what was it? What was at the root of his anger? It was his evil heart. At the end of the day, he craved the destruction of his enemies more than the glory of God would gain through the, 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 the mass conversion of the Ninevites. How selfish can you get? I mean, in a word, Jonah believed that God did not act in the way that he should. And, and again, that's all of us. 
That, that's all of us. When we don't get what we think God should give us, and, and, and look, there's some, some things we, we would want, and they're good things. I think I mentioned a couple of weeks. You, you might want to get married if you're single. And, and if you're married, you might want kids, and those are good things. To get married, to have children. But when God doesn't give you what you want, even though it's a good thing, and he doesn't give it to you when you want it and how you want it, and you get angry. And you get angry because you think you deserve it. And you, you might say under your breath, well, what's the point of serving then? I mean, what's the, what's the use of obeying? What's the use of faithful to me if he's not going to give me what I want? I mean, I think I should get it. And maybe you will. You just might need to wait. Maybe you need to mature a bit. Maybe you need to learn some lessons about God in the waiting. But all of this points to the heart. And in fact, if you're sitting there thinking, I deserve this and I deserve that because I've ticked this box and I've ticked that box and I've done all this for God and he hasn't given me what I wanted, well, you just sound like a Pharisee. I mean, what's, what's behind the motives of your obedience then? I mean, if you're taking all the religious boxes just so you can get stuff from God, that's, that, that's just unbelief. That's self-righteousness right there. Legalism, in fact. Listen to biblical counselor David Powelson. Now, this is a good quote. This is what he says on this particular issue. He says, God has never promised freedom from tears, mourning, crying, and pain, or from the evils that cause them until the great day when life and joy triumph forever over death and misery. The interweaving of God's glory and our well-being is far bigger than people imagine. People who are angry with God have often believed false promises or overlaid their own unjustified expectations upon God. They have then become angry with a disappointing God, sometimes confusing his actions and motives with Satan's and with evil people who imitate the devil's cruelty, end quote. Did you catch that? In other words, those who get angry with God are actually accusing him to be the devil. Or, or, or at least acting devilish, believing him to be the same kind of cosmic killjoy who just loves tormenting people, playing a, a so-called game with my life. In the end, ironically, it is the devil is one. Why? Because those lies about God, those, those, all those lies that, that he's not good and he's not benevolent and he doesn't know what he's doing, that, that's all unbelief. You believe the lie. Proverbs 33 says what? Buy the truth, buy the truth, and don't sell it. But you sold it. You believe the lie. God's not unjust, or that he is unjust, rather, that he is unfair, that he is unloving, that he's not all wise, that he's not all powerful. You, 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 you believe all the lies. Remember A.W. Tozer? Yeah, I think it's A.W. Tozer. There's... Two A.W.s, A.W. Pink, A.W. Tozer. But A.W. Tozer, the first line of his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, says the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about God it says everything about you. And that's so true. The first thing that comes into your mind about God is basically a commentary on you. Well, I think you're getting the point. If you are convinced that getting angry at God is always wrong, if not blasphemous, then, then what should we do when we become tempted to blame God for our pain and suffering? Um, I mean, just practically, what do we say to that? Well, remember next time we're going to talk a bit more about this, and I'm going to walk you through a number of what we call lament psalm, so you can see what the psalmist did. But just for the, this morning, let me just leave you with some few practical points. And here's one. If you're tempted to be angry with God, um, begin with this. Reaffirm your belief in the right and true character of God. And in other words, maybe you need to go back um, 
and go through some of those books like A.W. Tozer, A.W. Pink, and Stephen Charnox. I mean, there's a heaps of books out there on the attributes of God. Maybe you need to start learning more and more about God. Because obviously you're getting angry with God. You have a theology problem. You have a right understanding of God problem. And this is why it's so important that you understand who God is. In fact, when pain and suffering come, I, I call it a, a theological exam. Uh, you know, if you're in a good church, Bible-believing church, hopefully they're teaching you the character of God, and week after week, maybe you're reading about the character of God, and maybe sometimes God decides, well, let me test you on that. Let me give you an assessment on that. Let me see if you, you know, you've been learning about how good I am. Let me see if you really truly believe that. And trials come into your life. You've been learning this week that God's all wise. Do you really believe that? Let me test that. That's why the testing of your faith produces patience and understanding and, and it reveals the heart. And that's a good thing because if it tests your heart and you start having these angry thoughts about God, then you, you know where you're, you stand before God. And maybe you're closer to Job's wife than actually Job who said what? <laughs> Blessed is God. He gives and he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But we need to be students of God's character. We need to be students of his attributes. You need to be meditating on his sovereignty, his power, his wisdom, his goodness. Now, obviously, if you're angry with God, you're doubting on all that. And that's why I referred you to James here. Again, you can't blame God. He doesn't tempt anyone with evil. In fact, you notice what he says? Look at verse 16 if you're still at James 1. Every good, good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of life who does not what? Does not change. That's our doctrine of immutability. You know, when everything's going hunky and dory and we're, you got the sail up and we're just happy and the sun's out and we believe that God is good and all of a sudden the storm comes and the, and the winds are tormenting us and we're actually overboard and we feel like we're drowning. He, did he go from good to bad in that moment? Well, he couldn't because he's immutable. He's always good. So there's got to be purpose in that. You always go back to the true character of God. Not the lies. Study God. And, and notice he says in verse 16, don't be deceived. We, we get deceived. So you study God's attributes. You study God's nature. You study God's promises, his covenantal promises. You study his providences. You, you find it in scripture. Uh, you, you read it in the biographies. You, you, you find it in your own life. Look in the past. Look, you know, you're a Christian for 20-something years, and has he ever failed you those last 20 years? Why do you think now he's going to fail you now? This is what we, we, we talked about in the dealings with anger or dealings with any issue is meditation. Sit, pause, read scripture, pray, think through, talk to yourself. Why are you in despair, O oh my soul? Why are you angry, O oh my soul? Fill in the blank there, whatever it is. I mean, sit down, look back over your life and count all the ways God has been faithful and good to you up until now. And then ask yourself, ask yourself this question. Do you really believe that God has now changed his character or abandoned his love for you in the midst of your suffering? Do you really believe that he is capricious and reckless with your life? James says, well, he can't because by his own choice, he gave us birth through the word of truth so that he would be a, we would be a kind of first fruits from his creatures. In other words, you know how good God is? He, he saved you, didn't he? He bought you, and in one sense, he can do whatever he wants with you. And you can't complain because you are a sinner. So reason with yourself. If God is God, then he is an absolutely and infinitely perfect being, and thus incapable and impossible that he should make any mistakes or do anything wrong. You, 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 you see how? Just, just work through it. Wrestle through it. So that's first point. Reaffirm your understanding of who God is and your belief in God. Following that, number two, recognize your limited ability to fathom God's decrees. That, that's really the whole message of the book of Ecclesiastes. When Solomon says, vanity of vanities, all is vanities, most of us, without any study, think, oh, that, you know, Solomon's just pessimistic. 
guy who just looks at life and how bad life is and, and, and basically says, you know, all of life is vanities. I don't, I don't think so. I don't think God saved us just to say, yeah, it's a waste of time. What he's saying is vanity is trying to figure out life. That's why the, the, the conclusion is so important. The conclusion is what? Remember your creator in the day of your youth. And this I know. Obey his commandments. For this, all men are going to be judged. He, he, he is, you know, I, I worked my way through life in, in, in seeking pleasure this way and this way and this way. And I just can't figure it out. I can't, find, I can't figure out why God does what he does. In fact, Mark at Ecclesiastes 7.13. Who can understand the work of God? Who can make straight what he has made crooked? Try, try, try that because it'll be vanity. God does what he does and let God be God. And let God be God with your own life. You, you, you may get some answers for why he does some things on this side of heaven and maybe not. Maybe you'll get it one day or maybe not at all, but it doesn't matter. You're never gonna get anywhere trying to unscrew the inscrutable. It'll be absolute futility. We may never get it. We may never fully understand. We may never understand what God is doing and trying to figure it out. It's going to be like chasing after wind. Now, to rest in that and to submit to that, that's going to, that's going to take some faith. And that's why we need to increase our faith. We need to strengthen our faith. That's the whole message of Hebrews. You guys are wavering. You're prone to wander. You're backsliding. You don't like the pressure, you don't like the persecution, and, and so you, you, you need your strength, faith, uh, your faith strengthened rather, and that's what he's doing in the book of Hebrews. You need to trust him more, you need to lean on him more. You, you, you need to accept the eternal decrees of God who never makes mistakes. Is God all wise? Does he know what he's doing? That's the message of Job. That's why Job repents, puts his hand over his mouth, because I've talked too much. I've talked too much foolishness. I'm going to let God be God. God knows. God says, look, if, if, I, if I have enough wisdom to, to build this universe, to uphold this universe, and, and, and look at all the animals that I've created, and I mean, look at all that I've done, but you are made in my image, and you're my most precious creation. If I have enough wisdom to deal with this whole universe, don't you think I have enough wisdom to deal with you? I get it. Who has found fault with the Almighty? You can't. And then finally, number three, which I'll break down into three other points, what I call the three A's. This is how you help yourself uh, not to fall into temptation to be angry with God when trials come. First, acknowledge honestly your thoughts and feelings to God. Be honest with them. That's Psalm 77 we read earlier. Asaph was absolutely, in a, in a humble way, in a submissive way, was honest with God. He didn't move away from God. He moved toward God. That's, that's the point of trials. The point of trials is not for you to run away from God, but run to him. And he complains but as I said, he, he's, he's complaining with a breath, an attitude of faith, not, or belief, not unbelief. I mean, there's, there's no cursing, there's no bitterness, there's no scorn, there's no hostile belittling or blasphemies. In, in, in a, in a, in really in one verse, to sum up all the psalmists that do seem to complain to God is Psalm 62, 8. Mark it. Psalm 62, 8 says, trust in him at all times and pour out your heart before him. I don't know how many times I've quoted that verse to those who are suffering. Trust him at all times, even in this time, and pour out your heart before him. So acknowledge honestly your thoughts and feelings towards God. Be transparent. Calvin rightly put his finger on this. John Calvin, he says this, in the Psalter, God gives us quite a bit of latitude. He gives a man a license to complain. After all, since the aim of our lives is to know God as our Father and to enjoy his fatherly benevolence, we may urge him in our prayers to make haste so long as it 
is within certain bounds of piety, end quote. He's, he's absolutely right, and I like that. You, you have a license to complain, not about him, but to him. I call this covenantal complaining, just to give it another word, and we'll see this more next week. But the point is, the, the psalmist, and even what Calvin is saying here, don't be stoical about your pain, about your suffering. I mean, you, you do have three options. You, you can retreat and curse God. You can move towards God and, and, and have that covenantal complaining and being honest towards him. Um, or, or you can just throw up your hands and say, whatever. Kind of be that stoical, indifferent, apathetic. I, I, I think that's just as worse as cursing. In, in, a sense that, in a sense, that's a form of cursing. But you just don't care. A second A, analyze biblically those thoughts and feelings, all right? Be, be honest about your feelings, but then analyze them biblically. Evaluate what you're thinking and feeling in light of Scripture. Sort out your beliefs and motives. I mean, ask yourself, is, is, am I bullying up here towards God? And if I am, confess it right away. Repent of it right away. Don't vent. Don't vent it. And then thirdly, once you sort all that out, then act obediently. Acknowledge, analyze, and act obediently towards, uh, despite rather, let me say it this way. Act obediently despite your thoughts and feelings. I, I, know, the, I know the nature of man because I'm one myself, and I know we can get apathetic. I know we can get, get that indifferent, and we can just throw our hands up. Uh, because things aren't going your way. We, we seem to be that fair weather fan. We seem to be that sailboat that, that you know, we only go when the wind's going. You, you've heard that illustration before? Don't be a sailboat. Don't be a tugboat. Don't have anybody tug you. Be a steamboat. Be a steamboat means you're, you're chugging along all the time, regardless of the weather. Act on obedience and principle, not on feeling. Too many of us be, that's how we live most of the time. Why not our Christian life? We, we live on feelings. Oh, I can't be bothered going there. I can't be, you know, feel like getting up. I can't feel, you know, feel, feel, feel. Everything's feeling. But the point here in a, in a sound bite is trust and obey, right? Trust and obey for there is no other way. We obey regardless of feeling. So just to summarize and we'll wrap this up. When tempted to blame God and get angry at him, what should we do? We acknowledge honestly our thoughts and feelings. We analyze those thoughts and feelings biblically. We examine ourselves. And we act obediently despite those thoughts and feelings. Trust and obey. Obedience is the issue. Let me give um, the final word this morning. As I said, we'll pick this up next week and talk more about it. But let me give the last word this morning to Martin Lloyd-Jones, who says this, quote, Thankfully, God has not left us to the extremes of silent stoicism or boisterous blasphemy. He opens the door for us to voice our concerns to him wisely. He inclines his ear to his people amid our struggles. May the Lord spur us to renewed faith, holiness, and humility as we undergo honest dealings with him. End quote. And I trust that you guys would do that. As I said, we'll build on all of this next Sunday morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we have your word. Uh, we thank you that uh, we now know that it is wrong to be angry with you. And as we read your word, we see that there's no reason to be angry at you. You're a benevolent God, a wise God, a good God. And you bring trials in our life for a purpose, and we know even that from your word, and that is to ultimately conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. He suffered, why shouldn't we? He had trouble, why shouldn't we? And help us understand the purpose in trials. Help us understand why you bring those trials. Help us to bring joy and consider it joy when we have those trials. And Father, we ask that you would forgive us for any angry thoughts towards you, any blasphemous thoughts towards you. Thank you for forgiving us for that. May we help each other. May you, by the Holy Spirit, uh, conform us to Christ so we 
can humbly accept whatever path you have put us on and rest on that. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Now, just um, just to